This presentation was given at the International Herb Association's annual conference in Cornyn, New York in July 2012. My name is Conrad Richter. I am president of Richter's Herbs in Canada. I was asked to give a presentation on herbal trends in North America with a view from Canada. Our company is well positioned to comment on herbal trends in North America because we ship our products throughout North America and around the world, and we've been doing so since the 1960s. It was great to come to the conference this year. It was my first in 10 years. I used to serve on the board of EIHA, as did my father in the, years, in the early years of the organization. It was great to see so many familiar faces and to meet the new members of the organization. I thought the presentations this year were fantastic. I know I learned a lot. If you're in the herb business or you're thinking about getting into the herb business, you should become a member of the IHA and, be, and come to the conferences. The networking opportunities alone are worth the, the price of the organization, the price of the, of the conferences. Well, the organization has changed a lot since the early days. In the early years, uh, the, the forerunner of the current organization was the International Herb, Gro Herb Growers and Marketers Association. And over the years, the logo has changed to what it is today. In the early years, there were people and organizations from all aspects of the herb world. There were herb brokers, there were dietary uh, supplement manufacturers, or international trading companies, or photographers, or writers. Uh, there were small businesses, seed companies. There was, you name it, if there was a herbal interest, herbal connection, they were involved in the early years of the organization. Well, in the years since, some of these segments have gone on to form their own industry organizations that are more aligned to their needs. So today, the IHA members are mainly made up of owners and operators of herb shops, herb nurseries, herb farms, and herb-related services, such as booksellers and writers and media services. And the kind of products that they sell uh, are value-added products such as herbal gifts, or bulk herbs and teas, or foods that are made with herbs, or dietary supplements. Although the manufacture of dietary supplements is relatively small today among the members of EIJ, herbal supplements, uh, sorry, herbal tinctures, and herb plants and seeds. Our company specializes in plants and seeds, and so we, we feel more aligned to that segment of the IHA membership. But my remarks about herbal trends are pertinent to everyone, all the members of the IHA today. A pressing question, a vital question, that needs an answer for every business is who is buying their product. Who's using their product? And in the case of EIHA, since so many are growing plants and seeds, who is growing herbs is an important question as well. But these questions are difficult to answer. There is no one organization that is tracking our market and can give us a picture of who is buying and using and growing our products. So we have to rely on related data sets to try to, get, uh, to, try to build a picture of wh what our market is, who, is, who are the people buying our products. One of the data sets that I chose to use was survey data commissioned by the Canada's regulator, the Natural Health Products Directorate of Health Canada. NHPs are natural health products. In this slide, it shows survey results from 2005 and 2010. And you can see that in Canada, the majority of Canadians, a vast majority of Canadians, uh, 
are using natural health products. Indeed, the percentage of Canadians using natural health products increased in the last five years. This study, these surveys were, were um, done by a leading uh, survey firm, Ipsos Reid, and represent among the most reliable data that we have available in Canada on the use of natural health products. Natural health products, however, include more than just herbs. They include vitamins and minerals and amino acids and many other things. In this slide, you see some of the detail from that, from that survey, or those two surveys in 2005 and 2010. You can see that more than half of Canadians are using vitamins or minerals. And in lesser numbers are using many of the other natural health products that are out in the market. In this list are herbs and herbal remedies, specific ones such as echinacea and tea tree oil. The echinacea case is kind of interesting because you can see from 2005 to 2010, the usage of echinacea dropped by more than half, from 15% to 7% of the population. This to me suggests that echinacea is at the tail end of a, of a fad, one of these kind of faddish uh, explosions of interest in a particular herb that later falls back down to a more reasonable level. We've seen this over and over again in the industry. We've, in, the early, in the late 1900s, uh, sorry, the, la the late 1990s, we saw that happen with St. John's wort after uh, media reports that St. John's wort was as effective uh, as an antidepressant as Prozac is. And so I remember when farmers were knocking down the door to buy seeds from us to plant in large acreages of, of St. St. John's wort. Now today, St. John's wort is still an important antidepressant herb, but has fallen back down to what are the more reasonable levels of usage in Canada and elsewhere. And similarly, we're seeing the same with echinacea. Echinacea is an effective immune stimulant herb, but it's not for everybody, and it's not, and perhaps it had been overused uh, among the population. I also relied on on other data. Uh, in this case, the National Gardening Association's annual survey of garden gardeners in the U.S. In the first part of this slide, you can see the sales, the U.S. sales in billions uh, in, in gardening. And the total lawn and garden spend from 2005 to 2011, the sales went from $35 billion in 2005 to $29, less than $30 billion in 2011. In the same period, roughly the same period, flower gardening went from three billion down to less than two billion. Meanwhile, vegetable gardening went from 1.2 billion up to 1.7 billion. Herb garden was more or less stable at around 400 million, and raising transplants, which is of significance to those of us who are selling seeds, um, it was stable at around two to three hundred million in sales. The total U.S. household participation rate was also of interest. Total participation in lawn and garden activities was 83 percent back in 2005, and that has dropped down to around 70 percent. Flower gardening used to be 41 percent around 2005, is now under 30 percent. Meanwhile, vegetable gardening initially went down, but went back up. Same with herb gardening, went down and then back up. Raising transplants, however, dropped from 11% to what it is now, 8%. So 
So this, these data, I think, are relevant to herb garden, uh, to, to the herb industry, because there is a, quite an overlap between those who like to garden and those who like to use herbs. And um, I think we can extrapolate from, the, from uh, insights obtained from gardening data to what we find in the herb industry. Looking at the demographics, um, we, look, we appeal to uh, data from National Gardening Show in Canada called Canada Blooms, um, and also uh, from the subscriber detail of four magazines. And you can see in this slide here, overwhelmingly, uh, those that are interested in gardening and those that are interested in herbs are female. In fact, among the subscribers of Herb Companion magazine, 92% are female. Meanwhile, looking at age from much the same sources, we see that there's an overwhelming preponderance of older people that are interested in gardening and in herbs. Among Canada Blooms, uh, some 42% are 50 and older. However, the Canada Blooms case is a bit special in that Canada Blooms, the Canada Blooms show takes place during a week called uh, March break when elementary students and schools are closed, uh, elementary students are off and schools are closed and parents often take time off from work to take the kids to the Canada Bloom show as a form of entertainment while the kids are off school. And so the age is a bit skewed towards younger ages uh, in the Canada Bloom data. However, the Canada, Canadian Gardening Magazine is probably more reliable. There you see the 50 plus age group is 53% of the subscribers. Better Homes and Gardens is 48% in the 50 plus uh, category. These two added together uh, make 48%. Herb Companion uh, also shows a heavy uh, 50 plus or 45 plus is by far the majority uh, is in the 45 plus uh, age group. And the National Gardening Association concluded that 62% of total spending in gardening is attributed to older gardeners aged 45 and older. And so the picture emerges that among gardeners and perhaps herb, herb enthusiasts uh, as well, that we have an overwhelmingly female and older clientele. And this is affirmed by, uh, by what we see in our own business. Uh, we put on a free seminar series at Richter's. Every year we put on about 10 or more seminars uh, on herbal topics and herbal gardening topics. And uh, looking at the audiences, we can get a pretty good idea of uh, the, the breakdown by gender and by age. Here's a picture from, a, from, a fir from one seminar th that took place earlier this year. And I counted up all the females and I counted up all the people that I thought were age 50 and older. And I counted 70% female and 85% 50 and older. And there's another similar picture, in a, a, another picture from a seminar a little later on was 69% female and 81% older than 50. So anecdotally, we all kind of uh, know uh, that our market seems to be an older female market. And an important uh, demographic statistic is the households with kids under 18. 
I looked at the Canada Bloom data and also the magazine data and the National Garden and Survey. And you can see that that among the visitors going to uh, to the Canada Bloom show, 45% came from households with kids under 18. But remember that the Canada Bloom show uh, gets a lot of visitors that are really just there for entertainment purposes while the kids are off school. A better better uh, uh, representation of the gardening industry would be the Canadian gardening subscribers, and there, only 31% of house uh, of subscribers come from households with kids under 18. And better homes and gardens, 40%. In the National Gardening Survey, only 30% uh, said that they were from households with kids under 18. Now, why is this important? Well. Kids learn gardening from their parents. They learn by seeing and doing. And if the parents aren't doing gardening, well, the kids aren't learning the gardening. And learn, learning the love of gardening, and of course, by extension, learning the love of herbs. So this is a big issue, I think, facing our industry. Looking at another survey from the Canadian Parks and Recreations Association, this was a survey of park professionals where they were asked to rate from zero to seven the truthfulness of the various statements about children's activities. For example, a statement, children and youth do not spend enough time outdoors. The park professionals on average uh, rated that as a six out of seven, more than six out of seven. They seem, they agree that most children and youth are not spending enough time outdoors. And children and youth prefer technology, is rated almost a six among the, sec, uh, the uh, park professionals. So this paints a picture of kids that are more interested in technology and electronic devices than spending time outdoors. And by extension, that means that they're, they're, they're not learning about gardening and they're not developing a love for gardening. Ian Baldwin uh, was one of the organizers of the National Gardening uh, Survey. And he reflected on the outcomes of the survey in 2010 in an article in, the garden, in a garden center uh, publication uh, directed to garden cent the garden center industry. And he states, the garden center industry now needs dual strategies to resonate with both older and younger consumers at the same time. So on one hand, the, gar uh, the National Garden uh, Survey found that 62% of the total spending in gardening was attributed to those 50 and older, or 45 and older, at the same time found that very few younger people are spending much, um, or by extension, or by, or by um, by, by just pure logic, uh, younger people are not spending that much and are not being reached by the garden center industry. He commented that attempts to uh, bring in younger children by doing things like holding Easter egg hunts in the garden center or having Halloween events at the garden center are not, do, are not enough to bring in uh, the younger, younger, younger consumers into gardening. So this becomes a big problem. How does a, how does a, a business and a brand uh, attract two very different markets at the same time? He goes on to reflect on other related topics, such as the fact that when you do try to reach younger people, you have a problem that younger people are not interested in, in spending a lot of time making choices. So he asks, how many shades of pink impatience can a cope, customer cope with before she turns to an employee for help? 
So this pea adds more expense when there are so many different types of pinks. When, it, when young people don't have the time or are unwilling to give the time to figure out what type of pink impatience they want, they want to just buy whatever is, is the best. And they want to rely on their supplier to tell them what is the best. And they don't want to spend a lot of time uh, wait, uh, figuring this all out. And so, likewise, in the herb industry, how many types of rosemary are needed? How many types of thyme are needed? How many types of basil are needed? And is there a point where the choice becomes, a, uh, you know, drags down sales, slows down sales, and confuses customers, and actually turns customers away? These are vitally important questions that need to be answered. In Canada, we've had uh, regulation of a much more stringent manner than is in the United States since 2004 when the natural health product regulations were introduced. In the United States the regulatory environment is much looser and much easier to work with especially for smaller companies. However that seems to be changing. The FDA is pushing new uh, initiatives and the most recent one that I'm aware of is the good manufacturing practices requirement for herbal products and dietary supplements. I find that among our American friends, many are unaware that this has been brought forth by the FDA and that is now a requirement. And many are, are uh, ignorant about the costs of complying with such, uh, such regulations. So let us talk about the Canadian experience since 2004. Before the regulations were introduced, there were an estimated 40 to 50,000 NHP products, natural health products, on the market, representing sales of 4.3 billion. Then in 2004, the regulations were, were implemented. Between 2004 and 2012, some 60,000 product license applications were received by the Directorate. But because the Directorate encountered many procedural and policy difficulties uh, over the years, it has been relatively slow in reviewing applications. And as of March 2012, of the 68,000 applications it had received up to that date, only six, just under 61,000 had actually been completed. And of those 61,000 or so applications, only 34,000 were approved, a 56% inc a success rate. Now, although that 34,000 number seems not so bad compared to the original number of 40,000, 40 to 50,000. In fact, it, 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 ma um, it is masked by uh, uh, the Me Too effect. That is, that there are a lot of products that are simply the same, Me Too products. Um, and this is largely the result of the way that the regulations operate. The Natural Health Products Directorate has issued uh, a series of mo product monographs and have said that if your application follows the monographs, then approval of your product license application is more likely. If you diverge from those monographs or if you want to um, uh, get a product of involving other herbs that are not in the monographs or combinations of products that are not in the monographs, then you are going to have a harder time getting your application. And in some cases, you're going to need clinical studies at, at tremendous cost. So what we have in those 34,000 product licenses is a lot of Me Too products, as I mentioned, and you also have relatively little uh, relatively less innovation among those products. Some of the more innovative products uh, 
Um, the, the innovative activities in the natural health products industry has definitely been curtailed in, in Canada. Now, in the early days, uh, some authorities, such as Sean Buckley, predicted that 60 to 75 percent of natural health products would disappear uh, once the regulations were implemented. That didn't happen only because the government has yet to fully enforce the regulations. They keep talking about enforcing enforcement, but it isn't yet a fact or a reality in Canada. So a lot of products on the market aren't licensed at the moment. The moment the enforcement begins, the a lot of products are going to disappear and will be down to that 34,000 that have been uh, approved so far. And we can talk about the cost of regulation. Of course, there's the cost of the agency itself. It had to be created in 1999. The Natural Health Products Directorate uh, in 10 years since 1999 cost about $90 million. Well, you know, this is, sounds like a lot of money. It's actually not a lot of money. Although the principle in Canadian government circles is that in general, uh, industry has to, or, or is, such costs of regulation have to be recovered in, a, in the process of cost recovery. But that cost recovery principle has yet to be applied to uh, fully applied to the Natural Health Products uh, Directorate at this point. But the real cost of regulation is the effects that regulations have on the companies themselves. I give a couple of examples here. Uh, company A is a company that I know personally. I know the, the, uh, the principal involved. He is a herb grower. He is a herbal manufacturer. And he's also a herbalist. And he had about 100 products prior to regulation and had to discontinue 80 of them because he could not uh, foot the cost of regulation. Company B uh, is an American company that applied for um, the uh, applied for approval for one of, one of its products. Uh, which took four years to be approved. And it estimates, the company estimates that that those four years cost it uh, quite a lot of money. And in total, the direct and indirect cost of that product um, approval process and regulation was upwards to $20 million. See, in Canada, there's one big difference between can the Canadian situation and the American situation. The American situation, uh, you can go to market with a product and you don't, you don't have to seek approval from the FDA in advance, although that may change with the, that probably is different now with the GMP regulation. On the other hand, in Canada, the, the natural health products regulations is a pre-market approval system. You cannot sell your product until you get that approval. So there is a is there is a pre-market opportunity cost that doesn't exist in the United States. So that's one big difference between Canada and the United States currently. But the cost of compliance, well, you gotta have your product has to be licensed, but you also have to have your facility or your site licensed. So there's a product li uh, licensing and there's a site licensing. And included in all of that is uh, the good manufacturing practices, which includes testing every lot of every finished product and every lot of uh, every each ingredient that goes into the product. So that includes heavy, uh, heavy uh, metal testing, bacterial testing, and pesticide testing. All good things that everybody would like to have in their natural health products and herbal products, but extremely expensive, especially on a lot-to-lot -lot basis. And, with, and for the whole regulatory uh, um, requirement, uh, you need upgraded facilities, 
and you need upgraded staff. Staff has to be trained staff that can uh, implement these regulations on, on the premises. So it's quite a, few, quite a bit of cost compliance, which explains why Company A ended up dropping 80 of its 100 products. Now, it took some doing to get this information that's on this slide here. But um, I persisted, and, we've, and, I, and I, think, um, I think you'll find it useful. Uh, I wanted to look at the active site licenses. Uh, these are li these are s companies that are currently licensed by the Natural Health Products Directorate. Now, site licenses are required if you are a manufacturer, if you are a packager. So this is manu this is manufacturing here. If you are a packager, if you are a labeler of, of products, or if you are an importer. Any one of those four activities requires a site license for your business. And you can have combinations of those activities. So you can be just a manufacturer, or you can be doing all of them. So there are 10 companies in Canada that do only manufacturing of natural health products. Meanwhile, there are 59 companies that do all the four, four activities. So I put these into a chart, and I wanted to see the total number of companies that are manufacturing versus the total number that are importing. To me, that was a relevant comparison, or an important comparison. And it tells the story of the health of our industry in Canada post uh, the introduction of the regulation. So here we have uh, 283 companies are manufacturing products, natural health products, in Canada. And that includes all those uh, natural health products that I had formerly showed you in a previous slide, that such as vitamins and minerals, amino acids, and all the other dietary supplements that we don't ordinarily call herbal products. So if you look at that 283, you might just guess so that we don't have a solid information, but we could guess that maybe, let's say, 200 of those are manufacturing herbal products, maybe even less. So think about that. That's 200 companies, probably, in all of Canada. For sure, there were more than 200 companies producing uh, herbal products before the regulations were introduced. And because of the onerous regula regulatory requirements, many of which could probably uh, which are are probably cost a lot less to comply with outside of a country uh, a considerable uh, number of site licenses are many more but um, two-thirds are, are for importers as you can see here so 64 percent of all site licenses have an importing uh, component, and only 38% have a manufacturing component. I think this is really relevant and very important for understanding what the effect of regulation has had on the Canadian situation. Would something like this apply in the United States? Well, not currently, but uh, given the overall um, the overall direction that the FDA is going, it's not a stretch to think that the FDA at some time in the future will move to something that is more rigorous and more onerous on small companies, particularly the members of the IHA. Regulation, as I mentioned, it can be both good and bad, and it's important to point out, as has been said many times, in fact, it was often as given as a justification for introducing regulation into Canada, that with regulation, uh, uh, with regulation uh, there is the assurance of safety and efficacy. And so the idea was that if, if Canada goes down the path of regulation, then that will 
um, that would uh, increase the level of trust uh, in the marketplace and would have an enhanced effect on sales and the overall success of the industry. That has never been proved. That is just a statement that's out there and I have yet to see anything that suggests that that's actually true. That previous slide, I think, um, is at least some evidence that maybe that isn't true after all. On the other hand, there are instances I've heard, I don't know them directly, where Canada because of its regulatory environment is now in a position to export its products to other countries that don't have quite the same regulatory uh, uh, regimes uh, principally because of the, um, the high regard that, that s s some countries around the world have for, for these regulations. So there may well have been some payoff some spin-off, uh, some benefit to, to the whole regulatory environment for certain companies. I am more aware, though, of Canadian companies who did not go through the regulatory process and who, and who shut down their domestic sales at, and, and focused entirely on export. I know personally of one company that uh, exports all of its products to the US market because it's so much easier. So I think the, the, uh, the jury is still out on that question. Now there, are, there is non-governmental regulation as well and these are generally industry initiatives that are intended to improve the marketability of the products. So it's only fair to, co to comment on those. It's not as if industry doesn't want to be regulated. The industry does recognize the need for regulation, but it needs to be the right regulation. It needs to be regulation that makes sense and it benefits everybody in the end. So I would talk about the, the, the last three in, the, in this uh, slide first. The fair trade certification, green certification, kosher certification. All th three of those are well known, not just in, the, of course, in the natural health products industry, but throughout uh, the food and food industry and, 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 and beyond. So uh, there's not much that really needs to be said about those. But I do want to mention... Uh, uh, in a little bit more detail, the good agricultural and collection practices. This is an initiative of a good friend of mine, Connie Kaler, uh, who is the executive director of the Saskatchewan Herb and Spice Association and also the National Herb, Spice and Natural Health Product Coalition. She has been advocating farm-based uh, farm based, uh, practices that improve the quality of the herbal products coming off the farm in such a way that it will uh, that it helps farmers to sell their products especially to uh, the more discerning and demanding buyers that we have today given that regulation is a fact of life now in Canada many of the manufacturers are now pushing on their requirements their regulatory requirements for purity and for proper identity of the products etc onto the farmers and so the farmers uh, are looking to things uh, standards such as good agriculture and collection practices to help them uh, meet those requirements of their their customers so I think this is a very important initiative. It's something that uh, uh, is likely to happen in the American environment as well. And it may be, it may turn out that something like this will become the sort of the new type of organic advantage that, that uh, we once had in North America. Okay, another shift of gears into commoditization. And um, I think this is an important uh, uh, part of my talk because, you know, for, for so many years, especially in our business, we've, we've, you know, we've treated herbs as kind of a niche business, a niche interest among people. But the herbs have become so widespread in the marketplace and, and so widely accepted by consumers 
that they have become commodities in many ways. And that's what commoditization refers to. The way that goods that used to be different, used to be distinguishable in terms of attributes, end up becoming mere commodities in the eyes of the market or consumers. Now the guy who, who came up with that uh, definition, Douglas Rushkoff, I don't know who he is, but he wrote this and published it on, on the internet, I think on his website, and somehow this term took off. And there's even a, a Wikipedia page now about this term. So, uh, but I think the term is useful. I think people um, uh, uh, are finding it useful and are using it more and more. In herbs, I think there's no doubt that that in the herb industry we're seeing herbs now becoming more and more like commodities. Here's an example got me thinking about this. But earlier this spring, I, uh, I, I, my wife and I were just walking in, in a street, uh, walking downtown Toronto, passing by various shops. And in Toronto, many of the convenience stores, milk stores, etc., uh, will have a few plants out in the front for sale. And, uh, and here, in this picture, we happen to be in front of one of those uh, convenience stores, which typically sells, you know, milk and cigarettes and, you know, bread and a few other simple staples, uh, and along with these plants out in front. Um, these pictures had to be taken rather surreptitiously and quickly with a blackberry, so they're not the greatest quality, but nevertheless, uh, we, we didn't want to uh, arouse suspicion from the owner who happened to be inside there. But uh, here's a rather nice uh, pack of uh, oregano. And then you can see in the picture a few other herbs, including basil. Here's another flat on that same store. You see some mint and some, uh, some more oregano. And here's the price, $1.29. That seems to be the price on this street. You know, that price just really popped out and caught my attention. And I got to thinking about, you know, how, how prices have fared in our industry over the years. So I went back to our first, very first catalog back in 1970. This is a, a photostat of the original. We don't have an original copy anymore. So this is a photostat. It's, a, it's not the greatest quality. On the right, you can see my mother. And on the left, you can see my father. And this was the central bench, the first bench that any of our customers would see when they came into the Richter establishment. We started out as a bedding plant producer. We had mostly petunias and tomatoes and geraniums and peppers, etc. But as uh, customers no noticed a few of the plants in the corner of the greenhouse that my mother grew for her own personal use, um, and they started asking about these strange plants and started buying them, uh, my parents recognized that there was a, a market for these unusual plants that nobody else seemed to have. And so within a year or so, they were already putting them on their most prominent bench in the greenhouse. And so in this catalog, uh, we have prices. And you can see here that plant prices are in the range of 60 and 40 and 50 cents each and some of the other varieties as much as 80 cents in a few cases a dollar or a dollar 50 but most of them most of the common varieties of herbs are in the range of between 40 50 and 60 cents so i took those numbers and put them in a spreadsheet and looked at the rate of increase going from those prices back in 1970 to the 2012 price on that particular street, and these are the rates of increases that you get. You can see that it's pretty dismal low rates of increases. Here is the, the, rate of in, rate, the inflation rate over that same period, running at about 4.3 percent. So these, these price, prices, had inc have increased at far below 
the rate of inflation. If you take this inflation rate and apply it to the original prices here, you get these expected prices. And in fact, most of us in the IHA who are growing plants and selling them are trying to get three and four and five dollars a plant. Uh, so we're really in line with what inflation uh, would, would have the prices today. But due to commoditization and the mass production under mecha mechanized uh, conditions, prices are actually being pushed much, much lower today. So this is of great concern for those of us who are in the business of selling our herbal plants and seeds. Well, I'd like to shift gears once again and talk about organic certification in the herb industry. Years ago, when commodity prices were low, um, when farmers were getting low prices for soybeans and corn and other crops, they were coming to us asking about herbs and wondering whether herbs could be an alternative crop for them. Well, we gave them lots of advice on getting into the business, but and invariably we would tell them that they would be competing with the rest of the world and that they needed a way to distinguish their product from the rest of the world. And one of the ways to do that was to become certified organic. Because in those days it was difficult for foreign producers to get certified organic uh, for, uh, in, a, in a fashion appropriate for the North American market. And a number of businesses, a number of farmers did exactly that and did very well. But is it still an advantage today to be certified organic? To look at that, I looked at uh, worldwide sales and worldwide production and compared that with the American numbers. So in 2009, worldwide sales of certified organic products was $55 billion. And more than half of that was in the United States. But worldwide production was 37 million hectares, while only 2 million of those 37 were in the United States. These numbers show very clearly that the vast majority of certified organic products sold in the United States is coming from outside of the United States. Indeed, the USDA's National Organic Program uh, is set up now to make it easy for foreign producers to get certified. 43 of 93 certifying agencies are foreign entities. These are the entities that go around and certify the farms and certify the businesses. 13 of those 43 are in the third world. To look at this question a little further, I looked at um, the products offered by a major U.S. Uh, distributor of certified organic herbs. I looked at the countries of origin of 85 products. As you can see in this chart, uh, 30 of the 85 came from American farms. Canada, by the way, wasn't doing very well. Only one was coming from Canadian farms. The rest were coming from, uh, from other countries. So only about a third of the 85 products came from North America. So this clearly shows that organic certification of herb, herb, uh, herbs uh, is no longer an advantage for American and Canadian producers. That's not to say that um, it isn't necessary to be certified organic. It's just that it's no longer an advantage. Indeed, it is necessary because the average herb uh, consumer of herbal products uh, wants their product to be certified organic. Well, uh, I, I wondered about the, all the, uh, the oversight. How effective is the oversight of the producers um, outside of North America? And indeed, uh, we're already seeing uh, fake certificates 
uh, for herbal products coming from foreign countries. Here are two certificates for herbal products coming from China. These are known to be fake certificates. Here's another one from China for goji berry. This is a fake certificate. Looks great, but it's fake. Here are certificates from Cameroon, Kuwait, Russia, Malaysia. In fact, so far, fake certificates have been found from seven countries. So, this really raises the question of whether not only is certify, uh, organic certification no longer an advantage for American producers, but may in fact even be a bit of a disadvantage in the sense that um, it's, if, cert if, if oversight is not as good outside of North America as it is inside of North America, then North American producers may in fact be at a disadvantage. It's a sad fact that um, any document you want, any official document you want in some of these countries is available right in the marketplace. You, there are places where you can just go and you can ask for a driver's license, you can ask for any government uh, certification, uh, you can ask for academics uh, documentation, anything is available for a price. So I wonder, I, I question whether uh, indeed um, foreign producers do, are taking advantage of this lack of oversight in producing uh, products set to, that is being sold as certified organic and, um, and putting American producers at a disadvantage. This is a direct quote from uh, the USDA in an email message that was submitted to me and it gives you a hint of, of, of how the USDA is going about finding these these certificates. It says that fraudulent certificates have been coming from the certifiers whenever they've been discovered. But what this is not, uh, what what the uh, what the USDA did not mention in here is the corollary here that um, that the USDA is not actually actively looking for certified uh, for fraudulent certificates. It's only when they happen to be found. That they and that they are forwarded on to the USDA that the USDA even knows about them. So what we have in the U in the U.S. is a is a organic certification system that is mostly complaints based. There were two hundred uh, there were one hundred and eighty two complaints in two thousand and eleven. There's a little bit of active testing by the USDA. This is kind of proactive uh, checking of product, but vast majority of the enforcement that began in in uh, November of 2009 is a complaints-based um, uh, system. Um, since 2009, only 21 civil penalties have been levied. Uh, amounting to $130,000, and only one arrest and conviction. But when you think that over $30 billion of sales uh, 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 were recorded in 2011 for certified organic products, uh, with a price premium of roughly 20 to 30 percent, that's six to nine billion dollars of premium. That's a lot of money. And with a system that has weak oversight, you have to wonder whether there is a temptation to cheat and whether American uh, producers and Canadian producers who uh, are perhaps under greater, greater, uh, greater supervision and greater s oversight by the American system uh, may be at a bit of a disadvantage. Well, I don't want to make it seem like it's all doom and gloom for the members of the IHA and the herb industry, because it isn't. There are some wonderful opportunities out there. And so I wanted to share with you some ideas that I think uh, were, are well worth exploring. One of the areas is artisanal products. I'm grateful to the New York Times for 
publishing an article just earlier this year uh, on a this business here, Buddha Pastoral, based in New York. And I uh, basically I uh, lifted all the pictures from from the uh, New York Times website, and I thank him for that. Um, but artisanal products are high quality products, very high quality products, done in small batches and done by very knowledgeable herbal people, people who have a great attention to detail, who know their product well, and who are producing their products for a more discerning and uh, a, a, a more, more discerning market that has a little bit more money to spend. This opportunity, I think, is well worth exploring, and not just pastel, as you see in this picture here, but uh, many other products, I think, uh, could be done in the same fashion with a cachet. So you can see the products, this, these products here are made in small batches here on a household type appliance like a Quasinite. Here's the couple that owns Buddha Pastel and it operates Buddha Pastel. He does the selling in the market, farmers markets in the New York City area and she does the production. They have a five acre farm that they hope to get certified and uh, to produce their own garlic, basil, and, um, and parsley. Um, but for the moment they are purchasing all of the ingredients from a certified organic farm in New York State. So you can see everything's done in small batches. We're using high quality ingredients. And one of the uh, innovations in the recipe here used is, is that this is not roasted pine nuts. These are raw pine nuts. But it is a particular formula that um, the owners have developed on their own. And uh, as you can see, it makes a fantastic, fantastic product. And it's presented very nicely in these containers with the Buddha Pesto logo. In fact, the product is so successful, and this is the way you want it, uh, so successful that, and it's such a cachet and reputation already for this product, that uh, if uh, for some reason they, can't, they don't show up in a farmer's market, uh, their customers actually get quite upset. And you want a product where the customers are literally grabbing the product out of your hands. How nice that is. And that's possible because there is a market for a discerning, uh, for, for high quality products that, that uh, can only be gotten from small, um, you know, small operations like this, Buddha Pesto. So artisanal products is certainly one area to go. I, another area to go is what I call total immersive marketing. Um, this is a fancy name for what many of the members of the IHA are already doing and doing very, very well. Some of the members are out in, uh, out in Washington State on the Olympic, Olympic Island um, in the town of Scrim are doing a fantastic, fantastic job with lavender, with the annual lavender festival. Uh, what a totally immersive experience. I had the great pleasure to do that in 2009, uh, to go to a farm, to see the wonderful rolling hills with, uh, with all different types of lavenders in full bloom, to s the smell, of course, is heavenly, to sample some lavender ice cream, to purchase uh, various uh, cosmetics made right on the farm, and, uh, and all sorts of uh, knowledge and information about lavender, and you'd be able to even pick, to, eat, to be able to even go and pick your own lavender on his farm. What an immersive experience. They have done that uh, to the highest degree. I really applaud the, all of the farmers uh, in, in the Washington State area who have elevated lavender to such a, uh, such a degree. And of course, it's become a tourist destination now. And why can't that be done with other herbs? Garlic, of course, is an obvious one that's been done already in many places around the world, around, around the country. But what about mint? 
What about some of the lemon herbs? I think there's lots of opportunities here for interesting festivals, interesting on-farm experiences. So I invite the IHA members to, to explore more of that immersive farm, uh, immersive experience marketing. Well, at some point I have to uh, end the presentation and so I've thrown this slide in here to remind myself to leave you with some words of wisdom and there was once a very wise deity who was instructing his main prophet that if you want to change the world you've got to leave him laughing and if you can't leave him laughing well at least leave him smiling so I I hope I don't think I've left you laughing, but uh, I hope that I've at least uh, left you smiling with this slide. And indeed, uh, here are some pictures of our staff, uh, pe some of the people that we depend on totally to run our business. And I thought I'd introduce you to a few of them. As you can see, the, we've at least left them smiling. Um, here's uh, my wife, who is the greenhouse manager and she assumed that role a couple of years ago and has done a fantastic job. Here's Catherine, who looks after the potted plant section of the greenhouse. Uh, Ginnick, who is our uh, operations manager and maintenance guy. You gotta have, every operation has to have a guy like him who can do just about everything. Uh, here's uh, Ginny, for many years, our seating uh, person, a main seating person. Uh, she is now training a, um, a new lady who's not in the picture here, but uh, Laurie, who has taken over much of her duties there. Um, Bonnie, our retail manager, is, is so much involved in our in our, uh, our lecture series and many other uh, initiatives in our operation. Here's just a few of our our uh, office staff and and mail order staff. Uh, Kim. Kim Hector, who looks after a uh, uh, big part of our customer service and running the whole show over there in the office, and uh, and others here. So um, I don't have time to go through all of the other members that you see here, but we have many more staff as well uh, that make it possible for us to ship our plants and seeds and many other products around North America and around the world. And here's my final slide which I hope will, might even get you laughing. Um, this is a cartoon that we had done for us uh, for our So Natural line of organic, certified organic herb and vegetable seeds. And I, I'm sure you'll get the joke there, but uh, these are some of the brands that we uh, sell our products under. Of course, the Richter's brand that we sell our seeds and plants under. Uh, herb plants, uh, the So Natural organic line of seeds, our Herb Wild uh, herbal products and gifts, uh, and a, seed, new, a new one for us in the last couple of years, uh, Seed Zoo, which is a line of uh, rare food plants from around the world. So with that, I hope that I am leaving you with some insights and some inspiration some ideas um, and how to improve your business and uh, I encourage you to um, visit our website at richters.com that is r-i-c-h-t-e-r-s dot com and if you have questions I'm happy to answer them if you go to, to go to the Q&A section of our website I'm there you can go there and post your question and you can look at all the answers to questions in the past. Uh, I'm happy to answer questions about the herb industry and about herbs in general. Um, just uh, go and visit. I'm sure you'll find it a useful exercise. Um, so uh, thank you very much. Uh, it's been wonderful to be at the IHA conference in 2012. And I thank again the organizers, uh, Matthias Risen of Healing Spirits Farm and his wife, Andrea, who have uh, invited me and helped me uh, feel comfortable at this year's conference. Thank you so much. Bye now.